to confront Stanislavski and say, you killed acting for me, you killed the craft. And Stanislavski was like, whoa, 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 you guys are doing what now? Everybody, my name is Brian Lally, and my game is Brian Lally, Hollywood native. What you're about to watch an episode of, very good one. As always, sitting here with my partner in crime, Scott Williams. Scott, how are you doing today? Not good, Brian. I broke my rib. Really? I did. What was his name? Joe. Simple. Don't forget hey. that. <laughs> Don't laugh. Don't laugh for the cracked rib. Uh, Scott, who do we have on the show today? Today, Brian, we have two great guests, Jack Walker Pearson and Jody St. Michael. Now, if you guys are interested in acting, teaching acting, studying acting, this is going to a really great episode. There's some good information. Jody St. Michael studied with Sandy Meisner himself at the Neighborhood Playhouse in New York, and he's got a, a lot of other experience. He's had other teachers. Jody made a living. Uh, doing animals, animal characterizations. He was in Gorillas in the Mist. He was in the Country Bear Jamboree. He was on a famous Samsonite commercial as an ape. He has quite an extensive uh, resume, uh, live action and, uh, and character work. And Jack Walker Pearson was a teacher at the Juilliard School. Jack's got a, uh, he's got a great deal of knowledge. He's well-read. And we have a good time kicking it around, talking stories about, about acting and, and teaching and, and what to do. You know, there's a lot of good information comes out of here. So if you like that, this will be an episode for you. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you haven't already, what's wrong with you, Cookie? All right, stick around. Scott, what is the name of the guy uh, upstairs who makes the Oh, cook? yeah. The name of the guy upstairs is Steve. What's the name of his company? Steve's company is Funky Junk Farm. Right. Yes. Oh, he's incredible. Yeah. He's incredible. I've seen him on TV. He works with Ian Rossell. Mm -hmm. And I said to Brian, if this is the guy, is he there today? I'd love to, I mean, I'd love to meet this guy. Oh, yeah, wow. Forget this podcast. After this, I'd love to. He's phenomenal. Yeah, you can take a walk up there and see Yeah, his enthusiasm and his, you know, his energy and the stuff he does is, is it's incredible. And, and, I, and I've watched him on some episodes with Ian. And I said, man, I'd love to meet this guy some days. When Brian was telling me he's in the building, I said, are, are you sure? He yeah. looks like this. He has the afro. He's, yeah. he's got a real endearing face, always smiling. Yeah, no, and, and Steve treats everybody like you're uh, the most important person. I, I, just got, I swear yeah. to God, I just got goosebumps. He's this guy, is, you have to see his work and his, his enthusiasm. And, and just like this, his eclectic collection of things is incredible. It's beyond cars, too, and stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for letting us know that because it's right upstairs and we've seen it. I auditioned. I learned something really early on in my career. I was going to be naked in it at one point. I was going to do it. <laughs> Is that Scott laughing? He's heard the ref my reputation. Am so, I buying a ticket or am I giving it back? <laughs> I auditioned with, you know, Dan Bell, the commercial casting director. Did you yeah. take your clothes off for the audition? Just behind backstage, the guy asked me. He's like, "Come on, give me a, <laughs> give me a look." That's so to get Hollywood. the play, it had give nothing me, to do give with me a it. No, it work. no. I, I just told him I had to use the bathroom. He said, "Well, you gotta, you gotta strip down if you want." My friend was I won't say his name. He was in. Uh, Nobody's saying anybody's name yeah, here. You can't. Yeah, some of these stories. Yeah, I'm sure. He was uh, he was on Broadway opposite Liam Neeson in uh, I think it was. A, there was this show about Oscar Wilde. Was it called The Judas Kiss, maybe? That what I'm talking about? <clears throat> Anyways, it was about Oscar Wilde, so there's all these nude scenes. So he's naked in the show. And he said, the trick about being naked on stage, if you're man, is you got to, you got to beat it off before you go on stage so you look full, but you're not erect. He wow. Had, he actually said that. Yeah. Yeah, so you don't go on there. <laughs> so, so you don't go on there looking, you know, unimpressive. Well, and Liam Neeson well that's came interesting up, because Liam that's what like, I do before I go on yeah. stage with clothes <laughs> on. Liam said Liam Neeson came up to him backstage and was like, "What did he say, man?" The, I, I, it's he a misquote. Him? He, well, he get, he complimented him. Oh, I thought he. Whoa. He was like, he was uh -huh. like, 
exquisite <laughs> or something. On his like penis? That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. My He's... friend was like, it was one of the nicest compliments he'd ever gotten. Wow, because Liam Neeson has a legendary penis. Well. Janice Dickinson said when he pulled it out, she thought he was pulling out an Evian bottle. Wow. Yeah. It's, no, it's green or what color? <laughs> it's really clean, <laughs> clear. No, but that is. He went with green. I've never thing. seen a green. No, but, it wasn't a Heineken bottle. But honestly, right? on, a, on, a, on a more serious note, is is you know talking about acting and you know when we're working, we want to expose ourselves completely. I mean, and that's a successful actor is to be able to do that. You know, and it's very hard for a lot of people to expose everything about them. Uh, just as human, just the, you know, as personalities. And I haven't worked nude on a stage. I've been partially nude, you know, and I've done in s some films. And it's a very uh, yeah. odd experience in a sense that you really, as an actor, and is approaching it, and like, hey, is my, my dick big enough or not, or whatever, or how people perceive me, whatever it can be. It, you really have to do a, it's actually an, a great lesson in a way, because uh, you have to have a hundred percent commitment to say, "Hey, this is what I'm doing, and this is what I am." And then after, when you get off the stage and off the screen or whatever it might be, you can be as embarrassed as hell. But while you're doing it, it's a completely you have to. Well, it's freeing. I've been naked on film a couple times. You know, it's really freeing. I did a film once. I had to run down the beach, naked, and jump in the water. And when it was over, I just felt like. It was crazy. You know, it's just, it, it is a real freeing feeling. I'm a hippie, so I come from that time where we used to go to all these events and festivals and run around naked all the time. But, you know, so is every, you know, 10,000 other people. <laughs> but when 10,000 people are just looking at you naked, that's like, <laughs> okay. But, um, yeah, I remember prayer for my daughter they had. I, I, I auditioned for it. I actually didn't get it. I was real upset about that part. And... You know, there's a real big segment of the uh, play where the kid's naked. And I was really thinking, well, if I got it, would I do it? You know, just to be up there in front of the crowd. Well, this is important to keep in mind. Anyone auditioning for those parts out there, I don't, I don't whoever's listening. It's, Everybody everyone, is listening. Everyone who, watching. How about we say everyone who is listening, if you're an actor and you're up for a part like that, it's always negotiable. I don't care who you are. Whether you have credits or not have credits, those contracts are always negotiable. If you don't want to do it, you don't have to do it. And that's true. Well, as long as you tell the people before you get on set, because I had a buddy who was making a film and he put like 15 grand out of his own pocket and a chick there go, gets there and she, she wasn't that naked. She just had to be topless. And it was, a, you know, there was a, a sex scene. It wasn't, wasn't weird. It was just a couple getting together and, the guy had been sexually abused. We had a problem in the bedroom, so it was, you know. And so she shows up with, you know, this, got the location, everything. She goes, yeah, I'm not doing it. Yeah, the conversation should be had ahead of time. but <laughs> Yeah, no, it should be. But it is it, it negotiable. Anyone who thinks you're looking at a thing and it's just non-negotiable, yeah. that's, that's the point. It's, I agree. Everything's negotiable. I agree. Beforehand. Yeah. So. But maybe after you book the part. <laughs> right. So now I'm going to go back to the basics. So, Jody, we know you're from uh, oh, Brooklyn. I don't, does anybody even know who I am? Jody <laughs> St. Michael. Thank you. I don't you. think I even mentioned my name. No, I, but we're, the, we have ways around that because this is the movie world. We, oh, could, okay. we could put you, you could be sitting there and you'd be like, yeah, you know, and then uh, I auditioned for this play. Jody St. Michael. Well, I guess I don't have to mention my name now. <laughs> no. Keep working it in there for you, though. When did you know you wanted to be an actor? It's really interesting. I was thinking about it the other day. Oh, yeah. A lot of years back, by the way. I was going to Oneonta College at the time. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, you know, some guy over there for liberal arts or whatever I was up there for, just, you know, continuing my education. And a bunch of guys that I knew were actors, like just... And they weren't, like, together. It was, like, one guy here, he says, well, I'm doing the Fantastics next week. And I go, what? And then this other guy asked me if he can borrow these shoes because they look like boxing shoes. My friend Larry Kelly, who was one of the funniest guys ever in the world, and he was doing a boxing play. I forgot the, the title at the time. And then my friend Chip, he was doing a Shakespearean play during, you know, during the semester. And I was going, 
how do you guys do it? How do you, how do you go up? I mean, aren't you, you know, you can get up in front of people and, and speak. And, you know, I, I couldn't believe that they had the con constitution to do it, mm -hmm. you know. And that's where I first heard about it or kind of had an interest. <clears throat> mm -hmm. I left Oneonta <laughs> for the worst reasons ever. I was actually kicked out of the school. And I, <laughs> I, I went back east and I went to Staten Island Community College. Right. And they had an acting course, and that's where I started. Uh, this guy was really cool. Joe Giraldi, I believe, I believe his name is. I think, I'm not quite sure, I believe I might have met Harold Clerman there at one time. Really? This would be a million years ago, and well, of I course. can't remember, but he might have come in, and at the time, my limited knowledge of acting, I had no concept of who the heck was there. Yet. Right. Unicorn it was just some guy who was in the business, you know. Well, my uh, dad uh, said uh, about Clerman is that Whenever an actor was feeling down, that Clerman's door was uh, always open. So I, right, my dad right. was an actor in New York, and I didn't know if you knew. So he'd be feeling down. He'd go in there, and Clerman would get up, and he'd be like, Bill, you're in the greatest business in the world. You're an actor. You should. And he would get up, and he would just give him a speech. And my dad said, you could walk out of there walking on air. Well, the other thing is you're, really, you're touching history you're oh yeah greatness people right. i mean kids today don't even know who the name is so anyone you know? who doesn't know who harold clerman is <laughs> he he founded america's first real acting company the group theater back in the 30s it ran for like nine years but was humongously successful i love the reason why it tore apart though the group theater tore itself apart because of sense memory work right and it turned into stella adler went to Russia to, con th to confront Stanislavski and say, you killed acting for me, you killed the craft. And Stanislavski was like, whoa, 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 you guys are doing what now? <laughs> no, 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 no. We got it all wrong. As a matter of fact, this is what's up. So Stella Adler goes back to New York. I believe she went to Paris. Did and, she go to Paris to yeah, confront him? Yeah, not confront him. She I went to confront him. I didn't know that. Look, well, Stella there's, there's, Adler there's, was a force of nature. Oh, uh, yeah. That's why she went. She was furious that this guy, what he was with Strasbourg at the yeah. time, was, was doing with what he picked right. up from what Stanislavski was doing. And so she goes back to confront Strasbourg mm -hmm. after getting it straight from right. Stanislavski. And then Strasbourg's response was... Uh, that's why it's the Strasbourg system. Yeah, I'm not doing Stanislavski. Yeah, I'm do doing Strasbourg. Right. And within less than a year from that point, the theater just ripped itself uh, apart. And so well, she and Meisner were together on their feeling about about yeah. how it should be taught, and that's why that's why they split. Well, to continue with the conversation to about tie you. In, well, yeah, well, yeah, it's back in. Is at Staten Island Community College, and I have to credit my mom. She started looking at acting schools. Mm -hmm. And she's the one who really did it. And she shows me an article, I think Pat Boone, Pat, no, uh, Richard Boone. Richard actually, Boone. Richard Boone was teaching at the Neighborhood Playhouse at the time. And I saw this article. And I wanted to go to Juilliard. Um, it's an interesting story on, uh, it's a long story, so I won't get into it, about my audition at Juilliard. I did everything wrong, which I recognized after I left. I was a novice guy. I wasn't an actor. I was just learning the craft. And See, I've known you 37 years that I can remember. I never knew you even auditioned for Juilliard. Can I tell a personal story? No. What, what do you think? No, we're well, here only for commercial story. stories. Okay, well, the story is, and you know, I went on an audition to Juilliard. Right. And one of the things they said to me was, on the audition, your brother just died of leukemia. Oh, Jesus Christ. And you're singing happy birthday to him. Oh, Jesus fucking Christ. Well, People didn't know at the time. My brother just died of leukemia. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. you couldn't make this up. Yeah. Some weeping before him. Right. Cry, singing right. happy birthday. And I didn't get in. And then I look back and I realize, of course, I wouldn't be singing happy birthday to my brother with leukemia crying. I would be, it'd be a birthday party. You'd right. be happy. You'd try right. to make best. Right. But it was like the weirdest thing. I, I actually froze when they said it. I couldn't believe that was part of the audition. Right. Right. But I think in a weird way, it was meant that I was supposed to go to the neighborhood playhouse. Yeah. Which ended up being a much more grassroots kind of right. feeling and, for and who I am. And since you brought that up, your professional name is Jody St. Michael because... Right. I'm Jewish, and I changed the name to St. Michael because of my brother Michael. Right. So to honor your brother. Right. So, <laughs> so it's very funny explaining why my name's St. Michael and I'm Jewish. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, I... Uh, 
auditioned, which wasn't really an audition for the Neighborhood Playhouse. It was uh, Paul Morrison at the time was running it, and it was it was a sit down conversation. And he took me. He mm-hmm. liked me, mm-hmm. and I got in. And I was studying at the time. There was two classes. One was Bill Esper, of course, everybody knows him. And there was uh, William Alderson, who was right. in the other class. I was with William Alderson, which actually I wanted to be with Esper because of Esper's reputation. You heard at the time. Right. But the the thing that was fortunate for me was William Alderson was not as you know as established as Esper in a way. And that's the class that Sandy Meisner came back to that I was in right. after his operation with the throat cancer and everything. And um, I studied a lot with Sandy. Right. Sandy adopted that class. So that's going back to the group theater that I had the incredible fortune to study with Sandy. Right. And at the time, again, we knew about it only because it was like when he walked in the school, the way he was treated with reverence was insane. But there wasn't the internet then, and there wasn't all that free information to really know about the group theater and the history and who this guy was and what was going on. It was many years later that I realized, I go, oh my God, I studied with this guy. Right. <laughs> you know. Right. So that was my fortune. So very quickly to end it for you is my whole, uh, which we probably discuss a little later, is about acting and techniques and who you studied with. So. I would say my whole foundation is Meisner based, right. but it, I'm not just a Meisner actor. Well, no, no, it's and, my and I certainly agree with that. And my teaching has gone that way because I drank the Kool Aid when I came right. up, and I, it was beaten into me and threatened into me that this is the only way to do it. And the good thing about Larry Moss's book is he thanks like think seven teachers at the beginning of it, and later on he has a small chapter about anybody who says this is the only way to do it because it's not the only way to do it. And I feel like I was ripped off a little bit. And I got my own, you know, percentage of that, you know, of, of drinking the Kool-Aid. But I do believe the My- Meisner technique should be the foundation. Well, there's an interesting thing. Sorry to continue with this. but the one I don't thing even know I, why I, we brought you here. The, the one thing that I really didn't like about Meisner and, and the, whole, the whole atmosphere around it was it was negative reinforcement. <clears throat> right. And I really rebel against that. I've had incredible amount of fights. I don't like that. I don't want to be negative reinforced. They would say, well, it's the, the, to, you know, the, the outside world to prepare you. I, said, I don't have to be prepared. The world sucks. <laughs> you know, I know what, I know how negative it is. I'm here to be nurtured. And that's what I, I like to do when I'm teaching or I'm working or right. I'm participating, collaborating, whatever it might be. But that was the biggest problem I had at the Playhouse was the yeah, negative but, reinforcement. And we know over the years there's so much of that out of all schools, the legendary schools or all schools. Right. But you are pretty positive. <laughs> For um, You want me to say the line? Yeah. Or do you want to say it? No, know? you... Sh- <laughs> My line through life is, uh, I'm a pretty optimistic guy for a pessimistic prick. (laughs) (laughs) And that is Jody St. Michael. Well, so, we can go to the Juilliard guy here. Yeah, next door so, now. well, that's the thing, Jack. I know about you and respect what you do. We've obviously collaborated. One, one of the great nights of my, of my recent years is being uh, Christmas in your apartment and spending one two hours on 10 lines of a oh, monologue yeah. yeah that was fun the dennis franz you know lapd blue monologue yeah. that we sat there and just um it was hours that we that's all we talked about the beginning where it goes this and that i just love that stuff so being there and uh and for those who, who don't know jack uh jody owns a duplex walker pearson and, i guess and, and, i'm the one to do the introduction yeah. yeah and jack lives upstairs so it's you know can be a real it was great for me it was christmas right i think it was thanksgiving thanksgiving yeah. okay and i didn't have any place to go i'm i'm not crying i just had <laughs> i no, i just hadn't made plans and i end up up there and i get food and we talk acting i mean what what is a better fucking thing i can't breaking down a, a great speech from NYPD Blue, but... I'd like to get into that deeper in a minute, but let Jack talk about himself first, but about about script and... Yeah, of course know, we're going to. That's what... Know, that's what know, yeah, yeah. Because once yeah. you brought it up, I'm ready to, to roll yeah. on that. But uh, I, I think people should know a little bit Yeah, what was my first Jack line? Is. Do you remember my first well, line? Well, we'll get to that, yeah. <laughs> well, before about me, I want to say something about Jody. Um, I'll tell you what I love about Jody and why Jody is such a phenomenal actor. 
He's, no. an, he's an art enthusiast. <clears throat> the guy sees art in everything. And I think if anyone listening to this, if there's a takeaway today, find your enthusiasm for art. Man, Brian. You know what I love doing? Yeah. I love tapping that subscribe button. Mmm. I love it too, son. And just like all your dates, I tap it last. But nothing's as good as tapping this button. You see Brian here? He's not always doing the best. Financially, mentally, physically, for sure. You want to help keep Brian off the streets of Hollywood? There's a way you can help. Join us on Patreon. You want to tell them what we got on there, buddy? Yes, we have the general admission, we have the backstage, and we have the VIP all-access pass. So please, join today. I'm due for a bath. In the arms of <laughs> the angel, I from here. Um, he, he sees it in food, he sees it in architecture, he sees it in books. Jody sees art in everything, oh, and it's why he's a phenomenal <clears throat> actor. And that's, cultivate, your art, cultivate your art enthusiasm. And that is part of the reasons why the great teachers, and, and, and again, I mean, I talk about Larry Moss, I don't, talk, I don't hear a lot of other great teachers uh, in this day and age, I'm sure there's some out there. But they talk about going to museums, you, you know, to. listening to different forms of music, you know. When I first started doing the Meisner, I would sit and lay down and just listen to classical records back when we played records uh, back then because it opens up a different chamber in your brain. Yeah. So you have to listen to all forms of, of art. You have to. And it really... And you listen to the greats nowadays. I don't care if they're the young uh, English... You know, the older Americans or in, in between the greats all have a side that it, that is explored art. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, you know, again, before I'd like to get Jack to introduce who he, who he is and what he does. Yeah, um, just just kid, said, what, we're just going to talk. <laughs> we're going to talk. But, uh, and if one, I think it's gone too much, but, I'm going to get Jack in here. So we're just going to talk. One thing you brought you up. You negative prick. <laughs> Pessimistic. Pessimistic. <laughs> but there's uh, one thing that you brought up that I, I stress an incredible amount in my work, and if I'm talking to young actors or anything, is the peripherals of acting and what you were talking about, the art or something. I, I always, I, there's a technique, and I always say that, you know, a chimpanzee can teach the techni techniques of acting, and some are very good, by the way. But uh, <clears throat> what I try, yes. and, I, and, I, and I believe you have to know that to be a great actor. You must know the technique. But what I kind of stress now, because there's so much of that around, and so many people have been in, in, you know, uh, introduced to that, is the peripherals of acting, uh, the things about life, like you're saying about the, the uh, artistic things, uh, where you're coming from, who you are, what you do, um, and, you know, what you're good at, those kind of things that have nothing to do with acting that come back to it. So that's something I like to stress. And... Jack, I really think, <laughs> let's, let's just so talk about, let you, you know. Who well, you let's know. talk about technique a little bit. I believe this is the acting teacher, Richard Berlansky. I could be wrong, so what the fuck. The actor's art cannot be taught. He must be born with ability. But the technique through which his talent can find expression, that can and must be taught. So, I mean, I think that, that's, that's important that, that people have a place to go and Laura Dern studies now. She never, she never studied. Of course, she had two great right. actor parents, and she was mentored on sets. I love sets. her dad, by the way. Huh? I love her dad. And she was talking about just being on sets and being mentored by people. And now she studied, she's been studying for a while. I heard her talk about it. She said, I never want to not study again. I always want to be in a class. I thought, you know, and I always thought she was a great actress. I loved her, and I, I knew her, and she was always very kind to me and a good person. But I thought, you know, she's just wonderful. Yeah. That and Leonardo didn't study in the beginning. Now Larry Mosk's coached him for, the funny for years thing about and not years. Studying, though, there's something to be said about on-the-job training being a real thing too. It's different than class. It's different than conservatory. It's different than studying. To quote Mandy Mandy Patinkin in The Princess Bride, though, if you haven't studied, then you're just a gripper, <laughs> right? And you're just kind of like poking in the dark, hoping for a bullseye. 
Right. Honestly, though, I think you, the proverbial, the actor, you use the thing right up into the point and stop serving you. Right. If studying so much and script analysis so much and what's my circumstances, one of my objectives are, if it finds a way to put you in your head, then it's actually not serving you anymore. I think you have to do the work. I believe in the work. Believe in right. the process. But a lot of actors cling to these things that they're fed and it actually just brings them further away from authenticity. All these techniques, the goal is really just trying to get you to be more authentic. So the second that stops being the case, it's probably not serving your art. Well, the interesting thing I see is, um, and I, I use this kind of a analogy in a weird way, is um, when you're reading a book, you're completely immersed in the book. Um, you know, uh, if you're in the North Pole, you can feel the cold. You can feel the crunch, of, you hear the crunch of the snow or a seals in the background, whatever it might be. And then if someone says to you, hey, uh, Jack, and you go, what? And you come out of the book, and you're now in the reality of the world here, and you go, you know, you, you talk about, what, hey, did you, you know, did you get that thing for me? Yeah, great. Okay, and you go back to the book, and then you're right back into that world. Well, I see a lot of people who are in that world, and then when they take it off the page and try to say it, like, you know, in the book it says, hey, man, how you doing? And then they try and say, hey, how are you? It's like it becomes stiff, and they lose that, that, you know, immersed thing at the point when the text comes out of your mouth and, and it, 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 off, of the, off the page. And I, I'm always confused about that, that it's, hey, man, it, this is an easy thing in a weird way. In a weird way, it is an easy thing. I always say to people, hey, if you're a guitarist, your instrument's the guitar. If you're a violinist, your instrument's the violin. Well, our instrument is our body. And we use it 24 hours, <laughs> seven days a week, every minute. And we do it correctly, and then all of a sudden, when people get on stage or they're acting, they don't know how to use the instrument all of a sudden. I never understood that, you know. Well, someone way smarter than me, his name, uh, Gary Logan, he wrote a book called The Eloquent Shakespeare, which is a pronunciation guide for Shakespeare's text. Uh, I believe he teaches at Carnegie Mellon now. He's taught at a bunch of different places, though. Way back in the day, I had the pleasure of meeting and working with this guy, and uh, he talked about the stages of learning. So there are four principal stages of learning. Um, unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, and <laughs> unconscious competence. Can you, can you say that three times fast? Well, I'll break it down for Do you. Do it again. <laughs> I had to think about it for a second. It's been a while since I talked it's about great. it. It's great. But I think he's right. I think these stages of learning are right. And you see it in, you see it in acting all the time. Right. It's why you can have a child celebrity who's phenomenal – and then their head explodes when they become an adult because suddenly they're aware of their incompetence. But when they're a child, they're unconsciously incompetent. Right. Okay. So they're just riffing off of it. You know, uh -huh. that's your instincts are taking over and you're going to hit home runs and you'll have a career. But then something happens and you slip into stage two and three where you're suddenly aware of how good and how bad you are. So you slip from unconscious incompetence into conscious incompetence. And that's when your inner critic's just going maniac on you. Everything you're doing, you're hyper aware of. Just, you know. You have to write this down for me, by the way. But you, you can't function. Well, it'll be on film. Look, I just want to say this, that I, I want, want to make sure I got the name right after that quote. Richard Boleslavsky. Oh, Boleslavsky. So, right. yeah. Well, Boleslavsky is one of my favorite. So he wrote the book, The First Six Lessons. Yeah. Boleslavsky was Stanislavsky's student. Right. Who basically, Stanislavsky, everyone probably knows, wrote, a lot of books, but three major ones, the ABC of acting. Boleslavsky wrote one book, and it's very concise, called The First Six Lessons. And Boleslavsky probably has my favorite quote out of any teacher. He said, acting is the human soul receiving its birth through art. And I think that's true. That's our, that's our job, right, to give birth to another living being that we take on for a moment. Right. Boleslavsky also said it takes 20 years to be an actor. To, no, to be watchable. Right. To be watchable as an actor. <clears throat> I forgot Meisner who said, said it takes. I forgot who said to the line: actor. "People act like people. It's actors that usually don't." What's true? Well, what is your line about your great fucking line about DNA? No, about the scene that the actor knows the outcome of the scene, but the character doesn't. What I is forgot it? Who said that? Right, right. I thought right. that was you. No, I must have read it. So, listen, I have a lot of information in my head, so I must have read a lot of things. Oh, that's right? funny because when we yeah, talked no, about but it... But it was it, something you, I stressed, right, about yeah. that. Yeah, the, 
you always see it coming up, especially in monologues. Right. Uh, you always see it, which I can discuss. I could talk about monologues for hours. You know about how you, you can hear uh, the, a person deliver the first line, and you know there's forty or fifty lines behind it, just the way they said the first line. Right. And when a person says a monologue, they don't know they're going into a monologue. Right. So. That's kind of like that. Is that mode. an actor knows the outcome where a human being doesn't. And that's where the you problem know. lies, or that's where the problem comes up. Uh, the quote, the actor knows the, the outcome of the scene, the character doesn't, and that's where the problem arise. Right. The hardest arise. thing is you have to do the homework, but let it go. Yeah. The second you invert the 90% of the iceberg and you're dragging the 90% on stage with you, mm -hmm. it's unwatchable. It's not modest. <clears throat> but, you got to let it go. Brian brought up, a, it's a really tremendous point about acting, about that outcome thing. Mm -hmm. Because you can see how people are already playing the scene. A thing that I used to see is when I was in acting classes and I was helping teach, was you see, uh, okay, an entrance. The guy enters. As soon as he enters, he looks exactly where the actor was sitting. Hey, what's going on? That's funny. Yeah. That's funny. I'm actually working on a scene right now with a student. We're working on Long Day's Journey into Night where right. Jamie walks in, drunk off his rocker. All right. And Edmund's sitting there. And yeah. They, you know. And Jamie walks in and looks right at Edmund. And I was like, how do you know where he's sitting? It's pitch dark. Right. It's middle right. of the night. You're drunk off your right. rocker. You don't even know they're in there in the room. They could be in the bedroom or they could right. be in the bathroom. Plus, well, he's falling on the way up. He's falling down but, drunk. And, yeah. and he's... He's yeah. quoting. He's well, pontificating. And to me, what that is, is actors rush straight to the thing they can cling to. But that's to. also in his head. He knows that he's starting the scene. That's where it is. Uh, a thing that I, I, I like to do is one is like tell the actor to go off stage and come in and they have the scene that's already planned and pull that other actor off the stage. Sure. You know, and just have the guy it's come in and just see him like. Well, what do I do now? Yeah, right. you gotta. Well, you didn't know you, you were gonna sit there and have a conversation with the guy. You might have thought you wanted to have a conversation with the guy, but you don't know the guy sitting there. You're assuming maybe he's home, but when he's not home, now what do you do? Right. You know, do you right. look at me sitting there, you know, watching the scene, and you look at the, you know, people in the audience, or do you right. start doing something of real life? Well, you know, right. that's and interesting too, because even the most skilled actors have to stay vigilant on that stanley tucci went to my school and he came back and he talked gave a little master session and talked to us and he was talking about the broadway show he was in at the time with edie falco and they had done this performance for like i don't know he said they'd done it like for a year at that point or something and he was so over it <laughs> he was over it he was like, how do you maintain authenticity and a fresh connection over that many performances he said it was done he said he said, literally, I was going to finish the line I, I had. I was going to walk up stage, leave the theater, and go home. I was just so over it by that point. And that's what he did. He finished his line. He turned up stage and started walking off the set. And then Edie said her next line in a way she'd never said it before. To get him back. All right. and, and Stan heard it differently because she gave it differently. And because he's a good actor, he was in the moment and actually heard it differently. And he turned and he responded differently. And then she responded differently. And before you knew it, they had a whole new show b with all the same stuff. Right. What's the point? I should walk off the stage. You should, walk, you should walk off the <laughs> stage more often. You got you to gotta be, you gotta be willing to stay open. The second you're locked into a thing, there's no room f to, to actually be real. Well, when I was pretty new, I was working on the big knife, yeah. you know. Working with my companion in, you know, early days of the Meisner Technique, Annette Murphy, who... The big knife. Pat, yeah, Clever Odets, the big knife. Uh, um, Wait, where'd you Just do that continue with that, but remind me, I want to go back to what, on something what Jack was saying just now, but go ahead. So Annette Murphy passed away way too young, but she was a really good actress and a good friend. Anyway, so we're working on the big knife. And so Annette was a, uh, she was just a specific type of person. She was her own person. She was just Annette. And then there was this girl from, like, the advanced, advanced class. This is like the, and I hate that. We didn't call it master class back then, whatever the fucking, okay, I won't, I won't mention that organization. But I went to this chick, and she was just fucking sexy. She was a ballet dancer, and she was just a fucking sexy woman. And I rehearsed it with her. And she brought out so many different things in me because she was a different person. And then I went back to do the scene with Annette, and I did not say, Annette, you should be sexy. I didn't say anything to her, but rehearsing with someone else who's a completely different person has you see it a, com a completely different way. And it's always, it's always back here yeah. of how you're going to respond. You know there's a different world. 
And I learned that very, yeah, you know, I just came up with it. I came up with it. You know, other people have done it, but I was just like, I just want to see how a completely different person works at it. And it gives you a new way of looking at the scene. The trap, though, is, yeah. sorry, the trap is only dealing with what's happening with the other person, though. Like, I've had that experience where I was in a show, and then I was in the same show later with different actors. And it was such an incredible experience the first time that I knew I was going to have a great experience the second time. But I was so locked into the first experience that I, I struggled for a while to let that go and discover what these other people were giving me, mm -hmm. which was so infinitely just different. Well, you know? well, an interesting thing about acting is it's not really a solo endeavor unless you're just going to do one one person shows. But even um, a one person show, look at Robert, right. uh, um, look at Robin Williams' one person show that was on Broadway. The credits roll, and you think you're looking at the Avengers. Like there were a hundred people are still involved in a one person show. Right. But also, you know, we talk about monologues, but what Meisner always called them speeches because you're ta you're always talking to someone. It's not a monologue. It's it's a speech to somebody or to people. A point I was getting back. It, it had to mm. do with the Stanley. With, with who story. Jack is? Yeah, yeah. We did, well, let's just forget about it already. <laughs> yeah, that's enough. Um, but the thing that I I find also is you're working with another actor. And there's a lot of actors that are just maybe not that good. Or they could be that, that good, and they're just really stuck in the way they're going to say that line. Yeah. But, but two things. One is my greatest compliment is when I hear people complimenting the actor I worked with and said, that was the best thing you've ever done. Mm -hmm. Because I know I had a hand in it and bringing something out of them that they normally you wouldn't see. The other thing is uh, with, with uh, actors who are not that good, I've, or, or younger actors or don't have as much experience, I have people come off the stage and say, I mean, furious working with them, say they suck, this and that. It's, it drive me crazy. And I said, I love it. And I go, well, what do you mean? I said, it's like an incredible amount of food they're giving me now. It's way more than a polished actor in a way. Because like if I'm telling someone I love them and they just very blandly say, I love you too, it's like, it's not an actor saying, I love you too. It's my girlfriend saying she loves me, but not with enthusiasm. So I go, what do you mean? Right. I love you. Right. You know, and, and to me, it's not an actress saying to me, you know, back. It's, it's my loved one who yeah. doesn't have the same passion I have. So it drives me crazy. So I find a lot of, for me, I think a lot of my best work is working with people who aren't that good mm -hmm. in a weird way. And again, uh, like they might be doing something like, well, they're not supposed to be doing that here. You know, they're way off their mark or they're way off their timing. But I look at it as the human being with like some kind of weird qualities or something. Sometimes it just drives me fucking crazy. Sometimes. <laughs> I I'm got just it. saying. I got We all do. Yeah, yeah. So Jack, no, the Walker. No. No, Walker, no, I don't want to know about him. <laughs> yeah, what would you Pearson. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where, where are you from? I don't even know where you're from. I was born in Washington State. Washington State? Mm -hmm. Amongst the trees or... I was born in Seattle. I lived there till I was about three or four. Our house was Arson's on April Fool's Day. Moved. That was no joke. It was no joke. It was an uh, ex-employee of my father's had burned the house down. He actually walked across, across the house as it was burning down and was like, I got you this time, man. And I remember going across the street. We ate ice cream at our neighbor's house and watched our house burn down. Uh, after that, we moved to Camino Island, which was a small, remote island. It was kind of like Avalon, right? The movie when they're sitting outside and the warehouse is burning. Just like watching it go. Wow. Yeah. Wow. At that age, amazing. So, mm -hmm. wow. So you went to the island. So then we moved to the island. Where people don't carry matches. People don't carry matches on the island. You're surrounded by water. I, st I lived there till I was about 13. Then I moved to Texas. I was in wow. Texas. Wow. That's a... Uh, and it's a weather change. Yeah, well, yeah. Climate it's change. A, it's a big jump. My a political from, change. <laughs> yeah, there's that too. Uh, this is in the 90s. My father was from Texas. My mom was from Alaska. They kind of met in the middle in Washington. Was your mother an Inuit or, or no? No. Okay. No. Her father was fleeing from the police. You've been watching Brian Lally, Hollywood native. Now I want to talk to you about something I'm really passionate about, and that's teaching acting. So I co-founded Lola's Acting School with my son, Kyle Lally, Lally or Lally Acting School. I've been acting for a, a long time now of 100 plus credits on IMDb, 
hundreds of plays I've been involved with over the years, and I just want to share that experience with you. What we do differently here at Lola's is we give you practical advice that you can use on a movie set, on a play, an audition, anywhere. We give you the foundation to build yourself as a great actor. If you come to us, you don't know anything. We can teach you everything you need to know to be comfortable on a, on a set and to excel. Don't just listen to me. Look at what our students are doing. Daryl Wesley, who is writing on two hit shows, The Game and The Upshaws, and Ben Barrett, who is a series regular on The Politician, Megan Davis, who is uh, playing Amber Heard in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard story. Come check us out. We're at the Historic Arc Theater in the NoHo Arts District. You ever want to try plant-based eating? I have. What, you're a little confused, overwhelmed, you don't know how to get started? Definitely. Well, there's a simple answer to that. Go to Debbie Chu's Chew On Vegan YouTube channel. Debbie Chu is a plant-based RN. I've known Debbie for over 38 years, and she's very good at what she does. You go to the channel, and there's 300, over 300 recipes. They're simple, easy to make, and they're delicious. If you want to try it, you just might get healthy. Give it a shot. Chew On Vegan. So they ended up in in Alaska. I know a lot of uh, secrets about Jack's okay. life, and I'm not going to disclose any of them. But yeah. it's it's an so, incredible. Actually, it is. I'm, at, I'm I'm working on a book. It's my mom's autobiography. Hopefully, it'll come out in the next couple of years. It's called The Child of Many, um, and it kind of details all of that. It's so. un okay. unbelievable. So good. So you're in Texas. Yeah, where I kind of got my base into acting. Funny thing about Texas is. Texas actually has one of the largest um, theater programs in any state for high school. Like, Texas is known for two things, football, football and theater. Really? Yes. They have one of the largest competitions every year. They're big on the national level. It's very competitive. How'd you do in that? I've got my national championships. Okay. And my state championships. Wow. What city were you in? Uh, San Antonio. Okay. San Antonio. I and the Alamo is smaller than everybody thinks it is. Oh, it's so tiny. Yeah. It's so underwhelming, actually. Which I guess when you consider they were battling an army, you know why they lost. <laughs> you so I mean? you won a national championship. So you won with a team, individual accolades, or uh, both. Both. Yeah, we competed in everything. I was fortunate. I uh, yeah, thanks, thanks. I guess my biggest award would have been uh, I was. A presidential scholar in the arts in high school. I was the only actor chosen in the nation that year, which was kind of cool. Went to uh, Washington, performed for the president, and guest at the Kennedy Center, which was fun. I, I uh, later went to college at Purchase, SUNY Purchase, where I formally studied acting. After Purchase, I had the honor and the privilege to teach uh, back at Purchase, I taught at Purchase, and I taught at Juilliard, and privately in New York until moving to California. Oh, okay. So, where was oh, I just going to... No, no. <laughs> we got that so, when you went to SUNY, what did you... Uh, colleges get a lot of um, flack for, you know, what they teach in acting. A, a, lot, of t a lot of it's warranted. So, I'm going to ask you, what, what did you... What did you gain from that? What did you learn that you took with you from your college experience? I'll say this. I spent the first two years of college being pissed off, <laughs> just being angry, because I went to college consciously. I had researched. I knew what I wanted. Uh, purchase wasn't random for me. I love the, uh, the kind of stigmatism, the uh, stereotype that went with a purchase actor. I yeah. wanted that. I also have to say, you know, in high school, we were reading Stanislavski and Boleslavski and Eisner and Fervent Years. And so I was like uh, immersed in this. We had right. the fortunate. So you were reading all that stuff in high school? Yeah. We That's were, pretty fucking cool. We were really lucky. We had a teacher. I'm still catching up. Well, our high school teacher was a maniac, but he believed that. Good art was good art regardless of its setting. He thought acting and acting values regardless of whether you were in high school or Broadway or off-Broadway or Nacogdoches Road in the middle of nowhere, Texas, good acting was good acting. If you weren't striving for that, the hell were you doing in the first place? Right. And we rehearsed our high school, man. I was there at 6, 
7 in the morning, and we were there till 10 or 11 o'clock working on stuff every day. Every day, seven days a week, even on Sundays. It was crazy. I was playing basketball. Yeah, so when I got to college, that's what I was expecting. That's why I went to college. I was like, I'm going to college because I want the next level of this. And it right. wasn't. College right. is what you make out of it, ladies and gentlemen. And so is life. And so is art. You get out what you put in. And so I, and actually it was a really great lesson for me because I spent the first two years just really pissed off. I was angry because we did a physical warm-up in the morning, but why aren't we doing a vocal warm-up? I did a vocal warm-up every day for four years in high school, and now I'm in college. We're supposed to be better than high school, and we're not doing a, a vocal warm-up. So I did it on my own, which kind of ostracized me from the rest of the group because yeah. I was sitting here doing my thing because I knew I wanted to do it because I read Boleslavsky. And Boleslavsky says if you want to be a good actor – you do dance, you do ballet, you do fencing, you have to know about human anatomy, you have to be a, of authority on all elements of life because you don't know what you're going to have to step into when you go to acting. And I believe in that. I drank that Kool-Aid. Right. So that was a learning curve. And eventually what I learned is, you know, school is what you make out of it. Life is what you make out of it. And all these acting philosophies are actually just bullshit. They all, they all are. They're all right. But they're also all wrong. And I think that at the end of the day, this is, this is my bullshit. I think anyone who's ever going to teach is only able to give you their regurgitated understanding of their experience. And so it's never actually Meisner's technique unless you are with Meisner. It's a derivative of it. It's never actually the thing. It's who you're getting your thing from is that's the thing you're getting at that point. Right, but the, the, the mark of a good acting teacher is actually to improve upon it. Well, this is what uh, I'm and getting. even Meisner, because like I say, w one thing that I, I, I'll, I'll let you get back with that I don't, I don't see enough is, is the, uh, I, I see them holding on to the past a lot instead of it, it moving forward to, to you know, uh, what, what am I trying to say? A hundred percent. Yeah, and it has right. to. And this life's is, different than it Well, was. I tell the story of Bobby Lewis tells. I don't know. Anyway. Bobby Lewis t talks about, uh, he's being interviewed, <clears throat> very few interviews of Bobby Lewis, unfortunately. He's being interviewed, the man says, uh, what do you think about the Stanislavski disciples? Mm -hmm. And he says they are stuck in what they've originally learned. Yep. And he tells a story that a man told him that he went to see Stanislavski, and Stanislavski was on stage in a chair, and he was looking up, and he had a wheel of lights, of blue lights, and it was going around and around and he was looking at it and, and the man said what are you doing he said i'm trying to find a new emotion mm -hmm. and then he changed the lights to green and he spun it around and bobby lewis said to the interviewer he said does that sound like the stanislavski technique and the guy said no he goes but that was stanislavski so that's the problem that well, i had in the beginning of teaching and that i've evolved past is that you have to take the the um, you know the DNA you know the the DNA of helping people find their way and find their their voice and find their emotion and and what makes them tick is what is important uh, to do especially with young people but with all people. What well, goes back to what we said earlier? All these techniques ultimately kind of serve one purpose: to get you to be authentic, right? To actually experience the thing. You're right about evolution all right well let me jump around for a second so <laughs> i think every actor at some if point you're sit back, you can pull it back no it, yeah. it, it moves <clears throat> these microphones <laughs> no, move I'm, ladies no, and I'm gentlemen serious. i'm not joking he wants you to eat that mic i think every actor after a while has to be responsible to create their own technique and right it's usually an amalgam of everything you've been experienced sure and exposed to i wouldn't say i'm a meisner actor although i spent at purchase a lot of time doing Meisner work. Well, I'm 50% Meisner, I'm 10% this guy, I'm 4% of this guy. Exactly, and ultimately, me. ultimately it's just Jody. Every actor should, I guess is what I'm saying, every actor should be able to write their own book on their process. And if you can't, if you don't understand what your process is, it might be why you're struggling with your art. That might be an oversimplification. Well, what I always do is... Um, 
Uh, I ask people uh, where you're coming from. One of my first questions is why you why are you acting, and then they say, well, I I wanted to do this, I wanted to do that, or something, and I always, I look at them and I go, okay, that was a surface answer. What is the real answer? Why do you want to act? Why are you in this business? And it could be, it, there's no right answer in a sense. Like I can have a guy who says, hey man, I'm here to, to, to you know, meet chicks in the acting class, which is the reason he's there. Well, but that's okay because now we know where his work comes from. Right. That's where he is. So it doesn't have to be some incredibly, what do you call it's it? It's just got to be honest. Righteous kind of answer. Like an erect, it's just, why are you there? And that's where I, what I try to do when I talk to people and I find out, Okay, now we know where you're coming from. Truthfully, go home and think about it if you can't answer it right off the off the bat, you know. But once we find out, then we know where your work comes from. And once we center, it, it makes it very it makes it clear for the the teacher, but it also makes it clear for the person because they never really ask themselves that. I mean, deep. I'm not talking about hey, I want to be act. I like doing this. No, I want to be. It could be I want to be famous. Fine, but we know where we're coming from. We know where the work's going, and we know what your limits are. Well, how we can expand those limits, you know? But even that, there's room for evolution. You know, well, I it's just gonna, said that. It's going to yeah. change. Um, yeah. There's something funny about evolution, you know, and, and I witnessed that in college, too, on the college level. It's like all these schools, Juilliard Purchase, North Carolina, Boston, Carnegie Mellon, when I was going to school, they were so antiquated. They were very stuck in an old kind of way of doing things. Right. Old textbook. Yeah. And you can't. If there's something that's really cool about I think this industry and this art form specifically, it's like, you know, I love all art, but acting is the one I love the most. It has to evolve. Right. And it, and it does evolve. And well, the only time it stops evolving is when we become uh, complacent. Strasburg was a brilliant teacher. And the thing is, we were all fed that because of the sense memory or whatever, that it was bad. But, you know, I teach the animal exercise now. I teach the picture exercise now. You know what I mean? There's so many things that he came up with that are good, but that's not what we were told. Mm -hmm. So you can go through people. As you said, it's a combination. I love Uta Hagen with the three-minute exercises. Oh, even she rewrote her book. Right. Denouncing her first book. Right. Which actually, I think her first one's better. I, I'd, yeah. like, I'd like to make a comment on... Uh, okay, Mr. St. Michael. ...who don't know about sense memory and the magic if, let's say. Basically, the, the sense memory which Strasberg was teaching was going back into your past and, and grabbing emotional things that happened to you and like right. almost like a psychiatrist, like psych, what, I can't think of the word. We got you. But where Meisner was doing a ma magic if. So meaning was like um, in the scene, um, your, your, your mother dies, let's say. Well, <clears throat> in, in Strasbourg, you, you're going back to your real mother and you, you're taking that, those experiences and, you know, and, and putting in that sense where the magic if was, if your, your mother dies, you might laugh. You might hate your mother, you right. know, but that's not in the script, you know. Or what he was saying is also how you felt about somebody in the past is not how you feel about them today. You know, how you felt about someone 20 years ago well, is not sure. how you feel about them today. So he would say, well, what would be? That's why the magic gift. And an uh, example they literally gave was if, if you had a, a tuna can, that was the most precious thing to you. It was like you, you lost your tuna can as a magic gift as, as to replace to your mother dying in the script. And that's to warm your engines. Then you let go of the tuna can. But that's, I'm just trying to explain the difference for people is how Strasburg was doing that real emotional grab. Right. And... Meisner said, your viewpoint on emotion changes as time goes oh, by. Of course it does. Even if you laughed at the time you hated your mother, you might, you might be sad 20 years later. You know what I mean? Right. It, it, right. it changes. You're right. right. That's and what that's you're saying. It what changes. Meisner, well, I like to favor Meisner's uh, approach. I like to talk about a guy. People would come into class, and they would be doing something, and, I'd say, and they'd say, I'm doing this for my grandmother. And I would say, you don't really care about your grand, you know, you know, it doesn't mean anything to you. And they would say, you're saying I don't care about my grandmother? It's like, I have no fucking idea how you, how you feel about your grandmother. But on the, on the stage here, it's not coming across. <laughs> you're not. And there was a story about a guy from class he was talking about. He was trying to find it. And he talked about he had, you know, he had one piece of pie left that he wanted to get home and, and, and get to. And he went home and, his, and he found out his roommate ate it. And he punched his roommate in the fucking face. Well, that piece of pie mattered to him. But people are so afraid that you're going to think that they don't, li they don't like 
what society thinks you're supposed to like about grandparents or parents or brothers and sisters. You know, when people are in exercises in, in the Meisner technique, the Dorn activity, and I'm like, well, why don't you kick them out? They piss you off, it's my brother. What, you never kicked your brother out of a fucking room? You never, or you have a relative? My God, my brother and I went over fucking tables sometimes, you know what I mean? Brother was two years older. You never had a fight with your brother. You never yelled at your mother. You know what I mean? Everybody wants to be known as the correct person. Right. And sometimes other things matter to people. So it is, but it's the imagination that Meisner and Stella Adler found so, uh, you know, so useful. I had an acting teacher who said, fuck polite. Oh, yeah. Um, of course. You have to be, I think we should all be decent people when we're not acting, but <laughs> when you're acting, fuck polite. You well, you leave you that at, nice the, at the door, you which is to. really tough nowadays in the world we live in now, because I don't know if you ever used the three-moment game. Mm -hmm. It was a uh, Meisner, someone would say something to somebody to spark them, it could be racially motivated, politically motivated, but, you know, we used this for years, and then the other person re has to repeat it, and you say, based on the way they repeat it, how they were feeling about it, the emotion. Mm. You know, at one time I had a class of about 20, 25 young people. And I go, okay, we're going to three-moment game. A lot of time it goes straight to the gutter. And so we were playing, and I had this girl. She was a young Persian girl. And I, I said, oh, she's probably not going to go too bad. And then there was, another, there was a guy. I said, well, okay, you two go up there and you start. You know, you say something provocative. And uh, I said, but this girl's not going to go too crazy. And this guy was about six foot six. He was kind of timid. She's and this woman was about giant. five three. Huh? He's a giant. Yeah. And this woman was five three, and they stand across the stage from each other. And she looks at him and she says, Have you ever had a deke in your asshole? <laughs> and I'm like, What the fuck? And the class just starts going crazy. And now. All the girls are getting up, and they're, they're like, have you sucked a dick this week? Started and, the ball rolling. Yeah. So they're no longer saying, have you sucked a dick? They're implying that, I know you're sucking dick, Yeah. Have but have you week? done it this week? When was the last time <laughs> you sucked a dick? And they're going after each other, but it, it, but it was fun. I don't believe, I, I can't really have people on stage saying that. That's the way I feel, and that might be untrue to me, to have people come up there and say, yeah, people just won't do it nowadays. Well, well there's uh, got to be a distinction between what's acceptable in art and art exploration and what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, well of course know? there is. And one of the other things... But, the, I, but there's not. And that's why people are so offended by everything. We're, well, right. we're, we're quick to offend and quick to be offended. We're very sensitive nowadays. Well, not and everybody, but only the only the people that are going to blog about it. I think there's a balance to be found, you know. It's yeah. like if 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 you're doing it in the class exercise because this is where you can get away with doing it, then maybe you should check your reason. But but hang on a sec. What, what what I wanted to talk about one of the when I'm getting new students there, I say to him in the world that we live in now that they have put you in a cage. Do you not want to go back to our instincts as human beings and be able to just be free and say what you want? There's a couple of things you don't want to say, and, and, and I believe in that. We have some rules. It's just like intentions. Well, that's what it well, is. You know, there's a balance to be found. When we were doing fantasies with Meisner, they said it in the beginning. They said, we don't take off our clothes here. Meisner said, we don't get naked here because if you're not an exhibitionist, you're going to have an experience of being naked. So what we want you to do is create an experience. Yeah. Well, this, you know, the conversation you, you brought is going to another point, of course, is are we on camera at all, too? I guess. Yes. We got, well, yeah, there's six cameras yeah, I, I on guess, you, Jody. I mean, you know, there's six I, I don't cameras. do these iPods that much. Yeah. <laughs> there's six is. cameras on you, in case you Jack, haven't seen them Jack all and, around the room. Uh, Jack is a lot younger than you and I. Not really, in spirit. A really different place than jack does and i mean light years literally light years of what you and i have experienced and what he experiences and part of that is there's so many things now that man you can't touch or you can't go near 
because it's not only just about how it's so politically incorrect or turning off. I mean, it's also about now it's liabilities and lawsuits. I couldn't even imagine having a class and teaching a whole bunch of students. And, and one thing comes, the next thing, she, you, you, you're getting subpoenaed. You get sued for, you know, for something crazy in there. Right. When a lot of the stuff that we have to do as actors and as acting teachers is cross a lot of lines and go to a lot of places that can be very offensive without the intent, but that's part of the process of what we're doing. But then again, you know, the product is even different now. You can't make movies that you and I knew when we were growing up. You can't make these movies. You can't say certain things the way it is today. It's a whole different world, and it limits the arts. I should be able to play anybody I want or anything I want. I shouldn't have to be you know, a certain race to do this, or I, I have to be, you know, a certain, you know, person, or I, I, I you know, I, I shouldn't have to be an artist that can only paint one picture, and that's one picture from who I am and what I am. But it if goes want, back to, I'm sorry not to cut you off, but it goes back to intent, please. right? But now, intent doesn't matter. It doesn't Vigo, matter whether it's Vigo intent Vigo Mortensen not was asked, would you play Othello, given the opportunity? Vigo Mortensen. And he goes, uh, gosh, I, I mean, what an incredible role. But my question would be, why? Why? Why would I want to play this role? Well, just a, like I'd want to play any role. No, I but, mean, if but, you're talking about a, as a, as a, a professional to, thing or to make money or But we all have to public. be responsible for the work we put out there no, and why I, we put I it out there. I understand what you know? you're saying, Jen. It's like, how does a movie set in Egypt get made where everyone in it's white? That's not a mistake, dude. You no, know, and I, we have I, to be I, responsible I, for the work we put out there. So maybe, maybe the industry is getting a little tight, but I think it's warranted on some level because it will bounce back. No, yeah, it is bouncing back. I mean, they but literally I, tried to cast, and this is real. I found this out recently. They, the studios wanted to cast Julia Roberts as Harriet Tubman in the movie Tubman. There's a problem with our industry, and so maybe it needs to find a little balance before we can go back but I, let's, to let's let's talk breathing. about let's say in an artistic sense. Let's say I wanted to do a play, and in the play I am a Chinese woman. You can do whatever you want, but we have to right. be accountable for why but we're doing I, and it. And I'm doing it for the experience. Of, in a sense, that would bring me closer to Chinese women uh, and us together yep. instead of separating us more. Meaning that I'm just doing it because I, I, I want to have an empathy for that character, not as a, not as a character. So let's say okay. I just wanted to do that. Right. But you know, is that offensive because I want to do that? I, I did a palsy I, guy. I don't know. You know it wasn't about offensive. It was the story. I played I, a guy I, with palsy. Well, but that's different than a Chinese woman. I, that just makes no sense to me. To me, you well, know, this conversation. It goes back to the why. Why, yeah. why are we doing this? Well, I had a friend, and I, I think I had this conversation with Jack before, I had a friend who was an avant-garde artist in San Francisco. Who was one of the greatest actors I've ever seen. Is Kedrick Robin Wolf, who is unbelievable, and he did a play where he was a black woman, and it was phenomenal. A one-man and, show. Yes, and, it, but, and so one-man shows. There's always a little. I know, more room but I'm just saying he did that. Show. That was what he chose to do. He played a he played a part where he was an airplane. He played a part where he was this. He did everything That's across the, the board for the experience and doing it as an actor. And, you know, I can't ex ask exactly why he does everything, but he was phenomenal. That's and not the nature of this conversation, though. Right. There's always room for that. Yeah. And the arts need and expression and they need exploration. Created his role that way. But it goes back to the reason why something like that is in question and has potentially been ruined before he's even started that journey is because of how polarizing what the industry does. Well, we understand that. I'm not saying that's right at all in any sense. I understand that. But it, at the at same point, now it seems to be creeping further than just that. It seems to be creeping in what I could do as an actor and, and as an artist. That's, what, that's my point. My point is, listen, everything you're saying is correct. I'm not going against that. I'm just saying, though, when it goes too far. Well, it's seeking balance is what I think it is. At uh, well, some point, the, the scales have been so lopsided for so long that it has to recalibrate before we can find balance. Right, but now it's lopsided the other way. That's in, in right. A, in a very negative way to me. As but it's as not negative things. for other people is why it might be relevant. I, well, that's why I'm just saying in a weird that way that Brian and I, I don't know, if he, I'm not saying he's sharing the same opinion, but we come from Please. a world that's so different than what is today. <laughs> Please. Well, it goes back to evolution, you know? I mean... Yeah. And so wrapping back to arts, it's so important that we continue to evolve, I think. And we look at what good acting was 100 years, 500 years ago. You look at what Shakespeare says about acting. It's encouraging to think that 
maybe good acting values back then were still good acting values we can hang our hat on now. Although some of the actors of the times, they used to literally have mechanical devices that would let their hair stand on end so they actually look shocked on stage. But that was what good acting was back then. So we have to continue to evolve. Well, the funny thing about evolving is I was driving Uber years ago and I would pick up this guy and he was from Greece. And we started to, he was at some big, one of the big electronics gaming things that it's huge. It's downtown LA every year. E equals MC squared. I don't yeah. know what the fuck E3. they call it. Yeah, E3. E3. You, you mean, uh, should, should I plug Jack and I on that one? Yeah. So, E3. E3 anyway. I thought this guy was from Greece. And Jody was, wants to talk about a job we did. Yeah, I know. So, I'm not, so <laughs> You just said it. Tell him what we did before he goes into it. Jack and Jody built a 50-foot spaceship for E3. Oh, that thing was unfucking believable That's what we built I it would, for. I know. It was fucking unbelievable, that thing you built. Yeah, that was incredible. We're going to have to get a picture of that and insert and during this. Insert right, so your own spaceship just here. Jack no, was, and I was built on, it. So back to the Greece. Took us it was, a month and a half. No, so this guy was from Greece, and I was like, well, wait a minute. That's where it all started. You know what I mean? So I was looking. You talk about evolution. So back in, back in Greece, in the beginning, it was like, so there was one guy on stage, and he was acting, was one actor. And then 100 years later, it was like, we're going to put another actor on stage. And like, no. <laughs> it was railed against. Put another actor on stage. What are you talking crazy. about? You know what I mean? I mean, but that's how it started. And then they had the great chorus. You had other people on stage. And then we know it took, I don't know, did it take a thousand years? How many hundred years before they let women <clears throat> play women parts on stage? And that's the insane thing about People get set in something that, you know, to be the way it is, yep. and they're not going to change. change well, can I just bring easy. something real quick out? Is You brought up another, another part of that. Right. Was what we do is storytelling. And the, and we've been doing this, like you said, thousands and thousands of years from, you know, uh, you know the, the Greek stories and whatever it might be. And what I try and do, and it's something I, I would probably get into in a little that I would like to talk before we do leave. It's about script and, 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 and words and stuff. That might have is to be bring, part two. Is bring in the rich history of storytelling in a contemporary form. Right. Is exactly what you're saying. But I always say that. And what I find is a lot of the actors of today don't read these things. Well, no. And don't have that history and don't have that language and that knowledge to bring the rich history of storytelling right. in and, a contemporary And that's family. why I'm amazed that Jack read real-life drama in fervent years in high school. I mean, that, <laughs> that, that, no, no, seriously, yeah. that well, needs to be read by everybody. The, the, what, the, what the people of the group theater did, how they lived and how they sacrificed their, their lives, I don't mean dying, their, you know, their social life, their, their living, you know, to be part of this uh, group. You know, but to read that at 15, 16. Well, what's difficult about the arts nowadays is I, I think we live in the age of the microwave and people are conditioned to fast results I like uh, the and, and instant, instant results. The Internet has made everything so accessible and social media has made, right. uh, you know, where personality and vanity plays a part in it and not the arts. And so the hardest thing to do is you get break away from the microwave. You can't microwave good art. You have to plant the seed, nourish it, and go through the ropes. That's why all these great teachers say it takes 10 to 20 years to do it. And I, I don't think it takes 10 to 20 years. A anyone right now, based off of just living, can go be authentic if you can just go be authentic well, and have well, a Well, I have a whole thing about that because, you know, right now the biggest movie stars in the world is, is, is a world wrestler. And, um, it's very charismatic. I, and always, and I, and I, yes, no, there's no doubt he, he is, but the reality is is uh, I wouldn't give him a violin and tell him to go play but he also, but he also at, at the Hollywood Bowl. No, what, what I'm trying to bring at, I'm not saying he's bad, but what I'm trying to say is that the audience and people are used to mediocrity. There's the standard of acting the, is, is not as high as it would be as if I went to see a concert. Uh, you know, the really tremendous. I've seen the best actors in the world in theater who are unknown. Mm -hmm. Unknown. And people 
think they know good acting and what acting is and every, and I think that the standard is mediocre. Well, it's also because you know, anyone, yeah, compared to other anyone can be a critic, though. Your, well, your Uncle Bob from across the street can be a critic on the art of acting, you know? Right. Even and though they haven't studied or any of that. I want to say about Dwayne Johnson. He's great at what he fucking does. He's not doing Shakespeare, but he's great at what he does. I'm not saying he's... And what no, but, just, but, you know, but that's person. But there's a type of acting and a type of show that he puts on, and he's phenomenal at it. But I'm going, And that's why he's... Right, but he's, I'm going through the whole history but of... But even if of, you, look of, at, it, you look at Dwayne Johnson, if track his trajectory of being an on-screen artist, you see that evolution into artistry. You know, and there's a lot of great... Uh, Will Smith's Listen, a good I'm example not, of that. I'm not knocking him, and I'm not saying he doesn't have the right dude. I'm just trying to say that I believe that of all the arts, if I'm what, looking at a painting at the Guggenheim or whatever, the level of acting acceptance is m mediocre as compared to other arts. That's what I believe. Well, well I, th I think the there's process, still people hang, that are... Hang on, though. It's the process that's different, is what he said. You can't walk... Most people, I'm not going to say everybody, but most people can't walk up to a piano and play Chopin. Unless you've put in the time. Right. That's the difference with acting, and this is the irony of acting, is we're all actually putting in the time all day, every day of our lives, but it's not conscious. You know, we still have Kate Blanchett. We still have Kate Winslet. We have people that are, that are, are so fucking good and so good to watch and hard to watch sometimes because they're so fucking real. I mean, we have that, and then we have... The other things. I mean, I like the Avenger movies and well, stuff. Even Clarence said it. Harold Clarence said, "You need some flops. You need some failures so you can appreciate the good ones." Well, I, so I have, same I have a quote I wasn't art. prepared to bring today. I have it, and it was written like in 1920, and it was about movies being made for entertainment and not for an artistic quality. I mean, this goes back through the history of filmmaking. I'm just bringing a point out. It's just another point the, I'm bringing out. The thing is, at the time where we are in this country and the world, we need a lot of a lot of entertainment. Sometimes it's too dumbed down. It's dumbing us well, down I'm, too much. Okay, you know? sometimes I, I it is. So let me get back to this. This is something I wanted <laughs> to talk about when we got here. Jack, how did you get to Juilliard? Well, I taught at Juilliard. I didn't right. go to Juilliard. I had the fortunate fortunate chance of studying stage combat with a guy named Felix Ivanov, who recently passed last year, God rest his soul. Um, Felix was this Ukrainian cat, clown, master clown teacher, but he taught combat at Purchase, and he and I instantly hit it off. Um, he was much older than I was, but age is a funny thing, you know, when you're destined to be great friends with someone it kind of transcends age race religion politics gender and uh he and i became great friends and when i graduated he asked if i want to teach with him i was like are you kidding what an incredible opportunity so that's kind of how i got in the door i taught stage combat i taught combat at juilliard right yeah. so did you experience any of their process by being there with the other actors and stuff? Yeah, or? well, I knew a bunch of the actors at Juilliard. I had actually gone to high school with several of them. And the thing that was cool about my high school is we always brought back guest teachers and stuff. It's crazy that you went to... Juilliard is so hard to get into. And several guys you went to high school, or people that you went to high school with three, in San Antonio ended up in three Juilliard. Three people, yeah, that I knew. Wow. And so I would go back and teach classes and monologues and audition stuff. And um, same was with me when I was in high school, too. We had all these great guest teachers coming back from Juilliard, Boston, North Carolina, <clears throat> all the acting Ivy League schools. Um, but, you know, I would say, listen, there's something true about all these schools have a stereotype about them. And the stereotypes are true. <laughs> and you could see that manifest. But the other thing that's just super true is... Honestly, it doesn't matter where you go to school. It matters what you do while you're there. To yeah. Me. Hey, I always say that you learn a lot from a bad school. Right. You so, learn what not to do. Well, it's all about habits, you know? I mean, it's the habits you incorporate are the things you walk away with. So a bad school can teach you really bad habits. A good school can enforce bad habits you oh, know no, it goes I so one awareness. of the things jessica lane she was on a series which is a really great series uh, off camera with sam jones mm. 
she talked about Juilliard and she talked about at the end of a semester or the end of a session, I don't know exactly uh, which, that the, she would go in there and they were, they would give her compliments. They would, they would be, you know, they'd be nice and say things. And then she said, then they'd get pretty, pretty rough and really tell her what she needed to work on, which sounded like a good way to do it, you know, because as you said, this negative reinforcement that we've seen with so many of the big schools and the big teachers. She said they again got in and said this and this and this worked and this worked and this worked. And now you really have to work on this, you know. She said it was pretty, I think she said it was pretty tough, but. Yeah, I think all those schools pretty much do that. Purchase had a version of that. Even Dave Chappelle, I was watching his thing yesterday. He talked about how, um, man, in the semester breaks, they just tear into you about the stuff you need to work on. What was this? At the School of Performing Arts he went to in yeah. D.C. Mm -hmm. We had, like, written critiques and stuff from all our teachers of what we're working on and not working on, things like that, you know. The one thing I'll say about Juilliard, though, the level of focused concentration, like their concentration level was very high. Yeah. Yeah. They knew they were at the estrelon of training programs, and you could tell that. Yeah, there's an interesting thing about going to acting classes and instead of being some kind of program like that where you start at, you know, 8 in the morning and then you go all the way through 3, 4 yeah. o'clock in the afternoon and you have two acting sessions, then you have other things that are peripheral. But it's a it's a whole different discipline, which I was fortunate to have yeah. early on. I was older when I started. I was 10 years older than most people in the school and I rehearsed 10 times a week. And the teacher, you know, who ran the school was like, you you know, cut back in your rehearsals. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. He's like, I think you're rehearsing. You should cut back and make them more meaningful, but keep rehearsing. And the thing was, I had, I had a full-time job, but a baby, you know, when I started. And um, I had my buddy Clark Tufts and Annette Murphy, who I mentioned, they were down to rehearse any time. So I'd get up at 6 in the morning, and we'd get in a rehearsal before I went to work. Or I was selling cars, so when I got off at 9 at night, they were down to rehearse at 10 at night. Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to find the people that are like-minded, that are going to go with you and go up with you. Oh, it's so, like Jordan and Kobe, you know, stay yeah. in bird, stay yeah. in the gym, you know, hours after everybody left. Yeah. The thing I prided yeah. myself is I always felt I worked harder than, not in a competitive way, but I worked harder than anybody around me. You right. know, I would read the script until the thing was shredded. Literally shredded, fall apart in my hands. Yeah, I'd put it under my pillow, so I, even when I wasn't working, I committed to the idea that osmosis was working for me. Well, I had a thing, and very quickly, uh, what I believed also when I was doing a lot of work, I did Death of a Salesman, which is a tremendous amount of script. And I had learned in a short period. Um, <clears throat> but what I always did was uh, I'd have the script under my pillow. I guess it's a symbolic gesture. But what it meant was uh, the second I woke up, I read the script, the whole thing. Did nothing. Didn't go to the bathroom, didn't do anything. I read the script. And then when I went to bed, it was the last thing I did. I read the script. And then I shut the lights. And I, I really believe, like, subconsciously, you, you absorb a lot more that way. You know, because I have a lot of people who have trouble with lies. Anthony Hopkins thing. talks about that. Same type of thing. By yeah. reading the script every night. Before well, you. and Anthony Hopkins. And you dream it. Yeah. Anthony Hopkins in an interview of, uh, talking about Westworld said, I still speak the lines a thousand times before I get in front of the camera. A thousand times. And I believe that he's not over-exaggerating. It's, oh, it's yeah, why he's yeah. so good. He still <clears throat> works. Matthew Modine talked about doing Full Metal Jacket. And he, talked to, he got to talk to Kubrick about things. And he asked Kubrick about doing so many takes. Mm. And he said, I'm doing so many takes so the actors can learn their lines. He said when he was first doing it, he was working in England. Mm -hmm. He said he'd see these actors, and they'd be in the corner, and they'd be talking. And they'd look over at him, and he said, these guys think I, I don't know anything. I'm young, and, I, and you know, they're fucking talking about me all the time. And he said he found out that the British actors yep. were learning their lines. They were going over their lines and going over their lines. And when he was with American actors, they didn't know their lines, so they took 40 takes. Yep. To learn the line. Just, it's insane. It's lazy. It's why Tarantino said he'll work with the soap actor any day. Really? He yeah. says no one's more prepared. He goes, here's the unfortunate thing about soap actors. They get held to the stigmatism that it, they're all shit actors. 
But you try being an actor shooting 60 pages a day where you get one to two takes. Right. And tomorrow you're shooting another 60 pages. And you think yeah. you're walking away with phenomenal actors? Fuck you. These Some of these soap actors are the best actors out there, but they're so pigeon-held into a thing that's so fast moving that you slow that process down and actually give them a chance to work on a thing for more than a day right yeah you're going to get an actor who's prepared knows his lines it's going to give you a performance i just auditioned for general hospital that mark was pretty quick two things i wanted to say was one is you made a point is that it shows actors who have a fear of learning lines and pages that it can be done Mm -hmm. i work with some the hardest thing is not to learn a lot of pages quickly i didn't think i could do it I said, there's no way. But then I saw the people doing it, and I just, oh, I got bored real quick. You know? People used to ask me, and this is such a, it's such a question that I feel like actors get. They go, how do you, how, for people who aren't artists, they ask you how you memorize lines. How do you memorize so many lines? How do you do that? The hardest thing is not memorizing lines. Anybody can memorize a line. The hardest thing about acting is forgetting the lines. Right. It's got to be so in your veins yeah. that you can honestly let it go. Yeah. How profound. Yeah. So it goes, <laughs> I like okay, it. I'm going to wrap this you, back around. It goes back, to, that too. goes back to the stages of learning, right? So anyone who was listening to this podcast oh, at the beginning of it, the, I'll wrap it back up. Six cameras. One, two, three, four. Well, you keep saying anybody's listening to this podcast. Well, they, oh, they might be stuff. watching it too. So anyone who's partaking in this content. I'll we say. do have it in Braille also. Is it really? No. <laughs> Letting it go. Letting it go is the hardest thing about this profession. It's right. it's the it's the letting the ninety percent that holds your iceberg afloat go. So stages of learning, right? We'll wrap. The, I'll wrap this back around. Unconscious incompetent. I'm unaware of how bad I am. Right. I have no basis. I'm not trained. Conscious incompetence. This I is where you those two. where you first get into school. You first start learning, and now you're consciously aware of just how much you Conscious suck. Conscious incompetence. Where most actors, actually most working actors, spend the majority of their careers is in stage three. Conscious competence. Now I have a basis for the craft. I've read the books, done the schooling. I know what the work is, and I'm consciously aware of how I'm making the thing work. Conscious competence. And you can have a phenomenal career in that stage. But it's, but it's not the gold. The gold is unconscious competence. Sure. Where the subconscious mind is just taking over it. I got to tell you, when I first started acting, I was in a class. The guy who talked me into acting, and, I, and I'm uh, David Cox, I'll always be guy. grateful to him. Oh. I was on stage, and I remember before I did my improvisation, I was like going over, this is who I am. You know, I was, I was going over all this. I did this improvisation, and I blacked out like, part of the way through and then I came out at the end and people were laughing and stuff and I had no idea and then my Jody saying is that my dad I put the volume down yeah you thought like little Willie ate all the shit and thought it was chili my dad gave me a kind of original first edition of An Actor Prepares Mm -hmm. and Stanislavski talks about that in there and that's the only time it's ever happened that was 34 years ago you know what I mean and that's unconscious um, competence. Here's an interesting thing t- that ties in with that, which I always talk to young actors or other actors about, is is that preparation. Uh, I have the ability, after all these years, I just have to turn around, I do a little thing, and I can come out, and I can be angry, I could be bad, I could be sad, I could be whatever I have to be, uh, being a, a, a complete professional actor. So I, I say that's one of the only professions I see where people psych themselves out. So meaning if I have a plumber and he has to go, uh, you know, and, and uh, fix my toilet, he's not going to go into some ritual and start going into hyper breathing. Well, that go, might depend on the plumber. You know, I got I to gotta get this thing. Wait, wait. And don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. I know what I got to do. I got to get the plunger. You know what I mean? Or someone who's going to do your car. Right. He's going to tune your car up. He's just going to grab a wrench and go and tune your car up. He's a professional. That's what he does. He tuned up 10,000 cars, the guy worked on 50,000 toilets, you know what I'm saying? But you tell an actor to do something, okay, I want you to go up and be angry, and they go, well, well hold on, don't talk to me. And they go, they go into I this whole moment. ritual, and they, yeah, and they get into this thing, well, they that, go into the bed, they bang their heads on the wall, they come back, they do this whole thing, and they, like, like that. I'm just trying to say is, it's if you are trained at what you do, and you did your homework, like we've been talking about for the last hour, whatever, you don't have to do that. You take your moment, Boom, 
I come on. I'll be angry, I'll be sad, I'll do whatever I have to do, and I walk right. off the stage. One of the best things that Jeff Goldblum taught me as one of my early teachers was that they hired you to do a job, not to prepare. Mm. Great. So it's kind of, and, and if you're a pro at that point, that's what you do. Right. I don't have to question whether I can do the scene, and I don't have to question whether I can be sad or cry or whatever and that. But the Meister technique is Pavlovian. It's you have to be prepared to walk out on the, on the stage, you know, walk out on the set, and be ready, because you've already you've already put in the time. That's right. If you put in the time, right, in yeah, homework, but, you know what I mean. Which I, which, which, what you were saying, I see a lot of actors. If I'm, they're going to do some major scene, they're talking to somebody at the craft service. Like, what the heck will you be doing that for if you're going on in one or well, two minutes? Well, but even you know? P P Pacino's famous for that. He's famous for literally just having a conversation with anyone in eye's reach, right before they call action. So he can go into the scene and be natural. Oh, well, that, you know what's funny is Jeff thing. Goldblum did that with me on deep cover. I happened to be working on Santa Monica when he was filming, and I'm walking down uh, in in Santa Monica, I think on Wilshire. I'm walking down, and I see Jeff there, you know, and I'm like, hey. And, and he comes up to me, and he's talking to me about this play I was doing. Mm. And, you know, I was playing a hippie, and, you know, we, we were fucked up to Vietnam veterans and stuff, and... And it was mostly, the play was by the veteran side. So he's, Jeff's like, he starts talking, he goes, you know, the hippies, they had their, you know, they did it for a reason. They had their own point of view. You know, it wasn't just, and if I drifted mm -hmm. while he was talking to me, as you do, he slapped me in the face to bring me back. Not hard, mm -hmm. but he gave me a, you know, come stay, back and look at me, me. you know? Me. And so then I saw the movie and I knew the set that they were, you know, they, they, they were in and that's the type of scene it was where he was really straightening someone out on something. You know what I mean? And I just never forget that. It was fucking awesome. You know, got slapped around a few times. And he does that. He uses things. He's a, he's a, he's a great actor and a hell of an acting teacher. Death very, wish. very compassionate. Huh? Death Wish. He was one of the kids. He weighed like 111 pounds, six wow. foot five. Death Wish. Yeah, he smacked the shit out of it. Was Hope back. Lang? Who was it that... Uh, a raper or something? Well, the daughter, the but he slapped the shit out of her. And again, I don't where's know if that little beanie? If I'm but, correct, yeah. So, script analysis. What um, is the first line? Well, I don't know how much time we have to talk about it. What we were we going, this is, this I, is my podcast <laughs> and Scott's. But that's something I used to review theater in L.A. And I used to watch people come on the stage. And it was very funny. I used to watch them warm up. And, you know, i go, man, these are professionals. And some of them were famous. And then I'd realize they really started to drop in, like, it, in the second page or the third page. And it started different. And Warming I always said to it. that that first part was, like, so off. And, of course, we all know about coming in and the circumstances, whatever it is. But what I do with this... The script is, I really look at everything really, really deep. I also had a, a privilege to s uh, be taught by a, a friend of mine, Jesus Christ, uh, Scott Kelman, who really got into it. And he also did a lot of avant-garde theater, which is a whole nother a thing. He passed away. But what I came up with, it, it's, it's not anything new, but I put it in a conscious form, almost like, like a pilot's checklist. And what I always say is the first line contains all the genetic material and the DNA code of the play, the book, the scene, the monologue, the character. Again, the first line contains all the genetic material of the DNA code of the play, the book, the scene, the monologue, the character. Meaning the first line of like one of the most, you know, f famous speeches, to be or not to be. A book, it was the best of times, it was, it was the, the worst, worst of, of times. times. Uh, call me Ishmael. We can go on and on with first lines. Mm -hmm. And now I have people look at the first lines really deep. And that's something I do before I even work with any, if I'm working on anything with anybody, I look at the first line a, a million times. I said, we're not going past this first line. Right. Because the first line tells how to say the second line, the third line, the fourth line. So if, the, if the, the monologue was about, like the first line is, I hate coffee. Well, that's what the whole monologue's about. Now the monologue just, is just like the reasons why you hate coffee. So. That's what I get into is the first line. And the first line is there. It was either intentionally put there by great writers or it was subconsciously put there. But it'll always work. Even if it's like a throwaway, like, hmm, it says so much about the character, what's going on. And if you hit that first line correctly and understand it, you, and the reply line, let's say, the reply's first line, we will already see 
what's going on or have an idea of what's going on. And we're usually pretty much on it, you know what I'm trying to say. But that's something I work on and I, and I go over it. And, you know, a lot of people will, of course, the first line and you have to have all that. But I bring it to a very conscious part of your brain. And that's where I start on any scene, anything I read. The hard thing book. is the actor knows that there's something beyond that first line. You know what I mean? Like, if we can agree that potentially there's nothing beyond the first line, then that first line actually right. might get the attention you think it right. should get. Right. right. Well, we're already on the third page while we're saying the first line. Right. Now is the winter of our discontent. You could just go on and on with all, all of it. No, right? no, 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 no. You know, I, I talk about death of a salesman. Well, I'm talking, he doesn't even oh. know what it is. Yeah. We worked on this thing for a fucking month. Oh, yeah. The dreamer exams his yeah. pillow, yeah. which we're going to film in here. Yeah. In and, here. Oh, great. This is what a great place. But uh, like I worked on... He was on a roll. He didn't want to hear about that. Well, the last that. thing, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Very, no, 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 no. A really great example is I worked on Death of a Salesman. And the first line in Death of a Salesman is Willie going, oh boy, oh boy. It's a beat up salesman. It right. already told everything. And his wife's first line is Willie... Well, it's a woman who cares about a husband for the right. next two and a half hours. That's the whole play. Now we understand why he's beat up and why she cares about him, and it tells about. And then the play goes on. Just that, that to me is magnificent, and just an example of it. Those two lines. He just says, "Oh boy, oh boy," and the whole thing is about two and a half hours about a beat up salesman who's tired of life. Going you know? through the script, Kate Blanchett and inside the actor studio, she talked about the, the technique where you're literally throwing your lines out, where you're physically putting them out there. It's pretty interesting. I looked at, I looked into it. I think she said she didn't study that, but she just had we, one of the things she talked about when she first gets the script. So I was teaching a class with, with Franco, and we had 32 students, and we were working on Waiting for Lefty. And it was the Joe and Edna scene. And we had 16 male and female students uh, doing the lines at once and they were it was pretty loud trying to to get it across and then there's uh michael harris who was in the back i think he goes by joseph now and i just remember him screaming he was screaming so loud and i thought this is what it's about this is this is exactly what it's about Be because of that what we were messing around with that with the 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 script and trying to find life joe and edna joe is driving a cab he can't it's the depression he can't make enough money to support the kids the kids didn't even know what a grapefruit was they have no citrus they're going to get scurvy and the wife is about to go meet up with her old boyfriend because he has a job and joe just wants to be heard that he's doing the best he can and edna just wants to be heard that she'll do anything so her kids don't die and that's what it was about. It's not about screaming it, but it's about Joe just needs to be heard that he's driving a cab, he says, till the wheels fall off or to the rims, whatever the exact line is, and he just wants to be heard. It just, it's just great how you got to try everything sometimes, and you don't even know you're trying it sometimes, and it comes out. You know, just, you know what I mean? um, it's funny now that I'm older, I see myself as a mentor and I've had, I've been very fortunate to have some powerful mentors in my life and I realize how important it is for me to pass on certain things to younger actors, but I learned from everybody. I was watching a thing and there's an 11 year old actress and you know, all the uh, creature movement stuff I've done. Right. So like whatever the creature might be, you examine that. And this 11-year-old girl, she said, or something about a character, she says, well, the outside of the character was like a, a rhinoceros. I forgot the creature she used. And then she goes, that's the physical part, but the mental part was a turtle. And I was blown away. She was 11. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this my whole life. <laughs> working doing creatures and i always associate it as like if i'm doing a gorilla i'm i'm doing the external as a gorilla and my brain's a gorilla but i never thought of like you know you know even how like even if you're doing like a you know a rough guy in a play and you go oh i'm, a, I'm an ape or i'm a bulldog or something right. but she 
said something that, okay, physically that's how he might be, but his brain might be of a snail or something. Right. And I thought it was brilliant, but my point was that I, I am very happy to learn from anyone. Doesn't right. have to be older than me, or I don't well, have to be the top let, dog. And this let is why Jody's a good actor again. You got to stay hungry. Yeah. You know. Let and, me ask you this: How long did you work on *Gorillas in the Mist*? Six months. Six months in Africa. I worked at Warner Brothers for a couple of months. I was in Africa for over two months. I forgot, and then now I think I was in England for like. Oh, okay. Two but weeks. in Africa, were you in danger? Yes. Of the gorillas? Oh, yeah. <laughs> of the cats? No, of, of lions. We were in the lion territory. We were up in the Abadeus, which is, it was horrifying. I mean, it, the, I, I'd hear lions would be rubbing against my tent at night, and, and all night long, all you'd hear was, <sighs> <sighs> but like a hundred times louder and like from a beast right next to us. They chased us off the sets a few times, and the, the South African, the, not the South, the African guys knew how to deal with them. You can ward off a lion attack. You can't ward off like a leopard or a tiger. They, they lock in. But lions know enough with humans. But, man, they're gigantic. It was, it was terrifying. And I had to do, <laughs> I had to run off set a couple of times, in the, especially in the, the, when Digit gets killed. I had to run off away from the, like a hundred guys on one thing into the jungle on the boundaries of the shot. Right. And I go, is there a ranger there? And they go, no. I go, but, but what about the lions? They go, well, there's no gorillas here. They don't eat gorillas. I go, I said, does it know that? I said, I said, I look like a Swedish meatball to the freaking thing. I said, are you oh, kidding sorry. me? And I had to run off like a dozen times. I mean, literally terrified, terrified. The lions were all over our camp. We, it was it was awful. People went into shock being chased by lions. I saw them. They had to shoot them with like adrenaline or something, bring them back. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's nuts. But that wasn't as dangerous as the country bear jamboree. Because <laughs> you've done a lot of animal work in your time, and it was amazing. You came yeah. into class at one time, and you just went to the chair. You just made your fist, and you turned into a fucking monkey well it's interesting again i studied with scott kelman that has nothing to do with that per se but about sound and movement and it's amazing how much sound and movement plays in the script and how it comes back around to the script to the scripted work and the funny thing is that the uh stuff that i did for a uh, creature work um most of the guys who are doing creature work are 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 theatrical actors stage actors because uh, it starts like an internal place and to bust through that, whether it's anthropomorphic or cre or animal form, it comes from that place. And that's where the best performers were guys sure. who were like studied actors. They did the best work. Uh, there's, I worked with a few mimes who were great, you know, who just unbelievable with movement that worked. Right. But they also had a consciousness of, of the other part of it. But it also helped me as an actor, you know. And, you know, it was like I talked to one guy, you know, who every time, you know the person I'm talking about, every time he walked on stage, it was like he didn't know how to walk. And he was a world-class ballerina. A ballerina. He's yeah. a, what do you say, a guy? Ballet. He, he was, took ballet for years. Yeah. And I said to him, dude, incorporate that every right. minute. The body right. language is awful. And, and it, was very, it was very... Um, right, you would never believe his technical. resume, right? When, yeah, when we it was saw very him technical work. and then didn't really fit into what you know. was going on, which was a shame because it was really, really good. We're yeah. going to insert some of the stuff with you with your sword fighting and whatnot because that's pretty fucking amazing. I'll try to warn you. Prepare to die. Have it your way. <laughs> so you, you taught stage combat, but... You were able to use it in shows and... Incorporate it wherever you can. I've seen on your reel when you were submitting it for the Russo Brothers project. On Broadway, that was... Well, I had a theater company that uh, we did shows for 10 years. So, you know, we did all the choreography for that. Um, I was in a couple off-Broadway and that moved to Broadway productions. I didn't choreograph the stuff, but we did executed the choreography i should say listen for me i think combat is one of my biggest pet peeves i mean the last thing most people do in real life is 
get physical with another right. person. Right. So it has to be more dropped in. It has to be more visceral. It has to be more authentic. And like watching people execute combat for me is just like, oh my God, what is going on? You have to be in the moment. So in the moment. Dirty it up. Well, you it's it's it. crazy because we all know in real fights, no one gets punched a hundred times and goes it's over exhausting. tables. Anyone who punches, a- yeah. anyone who studies combat or fight like actual fighting you know that throwing a punch is almost more exhausting than being punched half the time and that's why cassavetti's chinese bookie film they take a guy outside in the back and they punch him like three times they rough him up they take him and it's like bam 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 and the guy's fucked up because that's real life Eh. you get a big guy punching a smaller guy three times hard Eh. He's fucked up, you yeah. know what I mean? That was Cassavetes. He kept it. He kept it real. John but Cassavetes was unbelievable. By the way, there's a book I forgot the name of it that is recommended to anybody to read because people don't understand how important this cat was. Cassavetes. Yeah. I know his son Nick, and <laughs> I can't believe you know that was his dad. Nick's one of the writers on the new the, Roadhouse. Oh, is that what I'm thinking of? I'm not sure, but. Don't sue me if I made a mistake, so... Yeah, come on, bring it. Well, I think we're coming to the end. What, you want to say something? Well, I'd like to plug my own podcast. Of course you're going to plug it. Yeah, Uh, that's what Scott was going to ask you, acting as if we were going to rip you off. Rip me off? Yeah, Show him his camera. A podcast I do recently, it's called Three Brothers and a Shot of Milk. That's Brothers Misspelled. That's N for a capital nerd. Yeah, it's geek content. So if you like <laughs> if you like comic books and superheroes and movie stuff like that, that's what we talk about. Three brothers and a shot of milk. All right, anything about your coaching? Any well, website? I, I privately coach, and I'm trying to take less clients. I want more time for me. So if you if you find me, you know, go you ahead know, and approach. I'm not. Know, I don't actively. An interesting people. thing, Jack and I, uh, we build. We started. We were building sets for theaters and stuff. Now we build major projects, film, TV, all major music videos. Mm-hmm. Jack and, is your mentor? And, well, I met... <laughs> it's funny, Jack and I were working on on something on a stage, and we just started talking about acting, and I looked over, and, you know, Jack's a lot younger than me, and he, and he started, like, you know that? Oh, this? And then we got into this really incredible conversation about acting. That's how we became friends on that. Well, so, come on, man. You and I knew each other 27 years or more before we I, talked yeah, acting. I couldn't believe it. Well, it we goes talked, back to... We all talk, we talked about was basketball. Right, but we saw each other when all the Molly time. When Molly was dunking. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't been dunking in many years, I'll tell you that. Well, Brian much. said something that I think is so important. He said you uh, find like-minded people. Right. You know, and I think that's true, especially in the arts. Studying at college and teaching at college, the thing I took away more than even some of the courses were the friendships I made. Right. Those like-minded people that to this day are still my best friends. Sure. That we collaborate and make art and you got to do that this is a a soul-sucking industry with a lot of rejection so if you don't find the like-minded people you can harmonize with it can be a really cold place yep one other thing that i since we're talking about all this about acting one is i'd like to even get deeper into the movement and and how how big that is about you know connecting with that but also uh one thing that jack knows i'm religious about is reading right i read all the time right and you can't just watch tv and you can't just watch you know look into your you know your phone you have to read and read and i read and read and it's helped me so much with saying lines because i read so much and i'm so familiar with words right that if i read the first line i've already seen the fifth line right. you know i'm not like struggling to get the second third and fourth it's like you know exercising your arms your biceps you're exercising your brain right. but i can't say enough any actor and anybody who wants to be an actor you have to read all the time right whatever it is i don't care if it's a pamphlet but read something you know it's funny when kathy bates did misery and then she went on that long run of films. She took a break at some time, and you just remember that someone saying, "What are you going to do?" She said, "I need to replenish." I said, "She said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read." Mm. That was, and I'm paraphrasing, but she was gonna take some time off and read and kind of refill her, her refill and, and her an instrument. And this thing you said about replenish, which is also, I mean, everything you could say would all we continue this conversation forever because it reminds you of something else. But I always talk about filling your emotional reservoirs. 
Well, that's it. You know, it's funny. It's at the end. I kept meaning to bring this up. Is that I don't think young people understand that as soon as you raise your emotional life in a scene, you stop acting. You're not thinking anymore. If you raise your emotional life to a certain level, you are now just reacting. Oh. You're no longer. Billy Elliot said it. He goes, "It's electricity. You just you yeah. know your lizard brain takes over and you yeah. just electric." I wanted to say that. Early on, I mean to say that a lot, but, well, people just don't understand. Anyway, I think that's about it. Uh, Great. Guys, thank hey man, you thanks so, so much for, for, for inviting us. Do you, do you want to any website or social media or anything you want to? No, no, I'm, I'm like. Yeah, make something up and then get like an Instagram account. I'm not kidding. He has an Instagram account. You can check out no, Jody's no, no, no. personal life on uh, Little St. Jody. He's Hold on. on Instagram. Jack started that. I never posted well, one thing. Well, in my you got to start so. posting now if you want to be an actor. What is it? Little St. Yeah, Little St. Jody. Uh, he's, he's, Little St. Jody for Jody St. Michael. Listen, he's, I woke up one day and found myself on Facebook. I didn't put it up. Somebody else did. I heard you woke up, got out of bed, and ran a comb across your head. Aww. <laughs> it, a long time ago. Now it's a, just buzz. All right. Thanks again. Uh, really, really enjoyed. And I got to tell you, uh, the place here is phenomenal. I love this space. The space I thought we were going to have more great. crazy stuff come up. And it just was, uh, you know. I thought we were going to have to tie Jody down or something, but Stay it didn't. Stay tuned for the sequel where we tie Jody down. No, I, I, I can have... Well, uh, he got a lot out in the car ride up here.